Yeah. Well, I, um, I'd like to welcome you to the Youth uh, Coding uh, Resources webinar, and we're going to be talking about pro uh, programs and resources for youth in our communities. Um, my name is Holly Wolt. I'm uh, here at the Library Commission, and uh, my title is as a Library Technical Technology Specialist, and I've joined the Library Commission about four or five years ago as part of a grant, and my primary focus has been working with uh, public computing centers um, and the public computing um, technology in the, the library. And um, I've traveled across the state. Many of you may have already met me uh, in Nebraska and have worked with the, the local libraries. Um, and I'm always thrilled to see uh, how libraries across the state um, who participated in the grant, uh, the LBBNC grant, mm -hmm. as well as libraries that have not uh, are taking the initiative to become uh, vital community learners uh, centers and using technology to provide services and programs to their local communities. And so again, welcome to all of you as participants. And uh, as uh, Krista said, in the interest of time, we have some great uh, program presenters today that we're going to be looking at the end of the um, at the end of the webinar, um, actually offering our uh, Q&A time, uh, but please feel free to, to uh, submit any questions along the way and we'll capture them and respond later. Um, and also I wanted to remind you, I did send an email out yesterday afternoon to all of the signed up participants that uh, we do have a live demonstration of coding that's going to be going on and uh, you are welcome to participate with that and uh, in order to do that you may want to be already have downloaded the tutorial for um, the demonstration and um, have a, a secondary computer that is has access to the web available to you so you can um, be able to uh, work alongside of Anne as she goes through her demonstration. Um, so today's webinar we're going to highlight the uh, new uh, Library Commission's uh, young uh, youth, uh, young adult and children's web page for resources for coding makerspaces and other types of STEM um, resources for libraries to go to, for librarians to go to, as, uh, to be able to um, see uh, what's available. Uh, Sally uh, is going to, Snyder is going to shortly be highlighting that for you and, and helping to explain what we have there and what we hope will become of this web page um, as we grow and develop and, and add more resources to it. So. Um, I guess in, in regard to that, today you'll see me coming in, out, in and out of the webinar and I will be the coordinating host uh, to introduce our various speakers. Um, again, we talked about we have a coding um, demonstration. We also have highlights for organizations across the state um, who are already involved in uh, working with youth uh, in coding and other uh, technology related programs and offering them and many of them are also being offered at public libraries already but we looked at that as a resource. Also looking at the uh, the opportunity to visit with a few libraries who have already offered uh, some coding opportunities or uh, STEM type programs in their public libraries and get their feedback as to um, how that went for them and what what they are thinking they might be doing in the future. So uh, in regard to moving on, we're going to start off and visit about our web page, uh, resource page, and I'd like to introduce Sally Snyder. Uh, those of you in the library, uh, in the Nebraska library system are very familiar with her. Um, she and I have worked together to try to coordinate uh, putting together this resource web page that was identified earlier to you in the summary of the um, of the actual webinar, and hopefully you've had an opportunity to go out and see it. Sally's had uh, over 30 years of working at the Library Commission and the last 12 as a coordinator for the Children and Young Adult Library Services. Um, and I approached her uh, in the fall thinking, well, maybe we should collaborate and come up with some ideas about what we might want to put out there for a web, uh, web page for resources for coding and STEM activities. And um, she was uh, visiting with me and she goes, you know, I've just been reading some journals about that and wondering, you know, exactly what this is all about. And in her normal style, if you know Sally, she just 
I said, what do you think? And she said, let's do it. And so here we are. <laughs> and uh, so again, uh, she'll take over now and uh, give a highlight of the resource page. And, uh, and hopefully you'll be able to go back and visit that again if you haven't already and see what we have available. There you go, Sally. Thank you, Holly. And thank you for getting me going on this because I was thinking I need to learn more about this. And I was kind of, you know, there's always so much to do. And you really got handed me the ball and we ran with it. So to get to our new page that's on the Library Commission website, this is our main page, as many of you know. And right over here, there's a place to type in a search term, which I just deleted. And we typed in code. So we're going to go with code. And the top thing that comes up is children and youth coding resources. And that's the new page that we're talking about. I'm going to just turn this over a little bit here. And so this is our beginning. We have quite a, what I think of as quite a few things on here, but it's a beginning. And I know that there's more things out there, and there are going to be more things. So we're going to try and keep up with what's going on in the world of coding and robotics and maker spaces and, and et cetera, mm -hmm. and add to this page or maybe create another page separately for maker spaces. We're still talking. One of the things I want to point out right away is after the introductory paragraphs, there's this link right here. Ask a question about coding opportunities for the library or share a coding success story. And if you click there, it goes, it's going to go right to Holly and just put in your name and where you're from and what is your question or what are you um, happy to tell us about. Or maybe you've seen a good coding resource that we don't have on our page and you'd like us to know about it and maybe we'll add it. So we'd really appreciate you helping us make this page active and fresh and full of ideas. As we get down to the actual resources here, you can see that they've been divided in general age ranges. So. Um, to give you an idea, if you're not even going to talk about children age 5 to 7, you want to go with tweens, then you're going to just jump right down to that part and look at the things that are there. You'll also notice that some things are on several of them, like Code Academy or Code.org and Code Academy are going to be on there more than once. And we'll have some people talking about some of these later. One of the things I wanted to do, I mentioned Code Monkey in my email I sent out because I had such fun with Code Monkey. And it's such a quick, easy way for you, if you haven't done it yet, to find out what is this about. OK, write code, catch bananas, save the world, play now. This is it. It's right there live. You just go to it and start helping this monkey get his bananas back from that mean gorilla. <laughs> well, he looked mean to me. <laughs> and of course, it's not going to load up fast enough. but. I have 10 minutes, so <laughs> I can wait. Oh my, that's louder than I thought. And you see, he dropped one. Look at that poor guy. Don't you want to help him? <laughs> okay, so, and this box tells you what, it, what they want you to do. So you say, got it. There's the code right there. And they've already written this first one. So hit run. And so it goes. And we'll just go on to one more just to get a sense of how it works. OK, now you have to fix it. It's got the wrong something. So click got it. And then it shows you, look, step 10 doesn't work. What are we supposed to put in there? Aha. Got it. So you go up there. And eventually, there will be several steps under here. So you'll have lines of code that will tell you to turn. Um, and do other things. So this is just the very beginning. We'll just do this one more and then I'll quit. Or I'll either this or I'll spend the whole time playing, playing. Code Monkey. <laughs> that's not what we're here for. But that's an idea. Whoops. Oh, I better turn that off or we're going to have uh, sounds in the background for the rest of the presentation. <laughs> OK, so we'll go back to our, our code page. And that's how I learned about what, what the coding programs are. This is my very beginning, and I'm looking forward to hearing more about what um, Anne has to say when she will be up here in just a minute. And again, I just want to scroll down, try not to make you seasick or anything, and mention 
the Ask a Question link. Ask us or uh, let us know about things because we sure appreciate that. And um, down at the bottom, in addition to the coding resources, you'll see at this time we have Maker Movement resources here at the bottom of the page and some additional resources. So we're just getting really started, like I said before. And please use the page and, and send us information. Well, thank you, and Sally. Thank you. Um, Sally and I have enjoyed uh, uh, sharing emails and uh, talking about our exploration of the online coding resources. And uh, uh, this Code Monkey is quite fun because it just makes you feel good when you get <laughs> able to He's accomplish so something. happy when he gets his banana. <laughs> so as we transition over to our um, next uh, speaker who will be providing us with some um, actual demonstration of working with coding, um, I just wanted to mention a couple of things that I, I've been reading and thinking about is that um, programming is a basic literacy and in today's world it's full of web services like YouTube, Netflix, Facebook and they're all key parts of our kids daily lives and um, even our toys are digital and many are programmable and young kids are doing that as we see from this code monkey that's very possible to, to work with programming with a, like uh, products like LeapFrog. And so it, it's one thing to know how to use the programs, which I think many of us um, either stumble through and become aware or we're actually um, able to, um, you know, have our kids teach us sometimes. But it's another thing to understand the logic behind the work. And this is the challenge for kids today who may love to deal with this, but they don't know how it works. And so the, the idea of working with coding is to help them to get a foundation to understand how how they are able to use these applications and be able to innovatively develop some of their own um, and uh, and learn more about the structures of and how to code. Um, it says that in the future, the amount of technology and the reliance on it will only increase, and we know that. And the students today need to be able to uh, not only use the technology but understand and be able to control it. And I think this is where we, we uh, are looking to um, highlight these uh, opportunities like coding in libraries for the youth. So we have Ann Byers now, who's sitting next to me. Uh, she's uh, uh, from um, uh, the, well, I guess I should say you're the manager of the eHealth and Community Information Technology for the Nebraska Information Technology Commission. That's quite a mouthful. It is. <laughs> and uh, she provides support to the Commission's advisory group on community technology and e-health issues. And she's also involved in the planning uh, component of the Nebraska Public Service Commission's Broadband Mapping Grant. And uh, as a Nebraska library participant, you may have uh, seen that. We did host uh, some information and had the, the Public Service Commission on and, and discuss the, the mapping grants. Um, she, uh, she has a bachelor's degree in journalism from the University of Nebraska and a master's degree in human resources education from uh, Boston University. And I'm thinking she's glad she wasn't there last week. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and she resides in Lincoln uh, with her husband and has a needy dog and I can appreciate that because I also have one of those. <laughs> so anyway, she'll be just demonstrating the, from the website code.org uh, using a very popular Disney theme, Frozen. And again, this is where you would want your tutorial and uh, a laptop perhaps uh, by your side if you're interested in following along. But I think it's more important if, if, you, if you get, uh, it becomes an issue for you to be doing that, I think it'd be great if you just follow along with her and then use that tutorial to write notes on and, and as a backup and come back to it again. So again, thank you, Anne, for uh, volunteering to do this presentation. Oh, well, thank you, Holly, and thank you for giving me an excuse to play with code.org while I'm working and get paid for it, <laughs> because it really is a lot of fun. Um, code.org has some great resources to teach kids how to code. Every year they sponsor the annual Hour of Code. It's in December, and I believe Jessica is going to talk a little bit about um, the, the experience of the Norfolk Public Library and offering an hour of code. Um, this year's exercise tutorial is um, based on Frozen. Last year it was Angry Birds and Zombies and that last year's tutorial is still available. And so you might want to think ahead about planning for next December, but it's something that could be done even if it's not during the week of the hour of code. 
And so I'm going to just show you that really anybody can do this. You don't need a lot of coding experience, or if, like me, your coding experience is like in the 80s, um, and you know, not maybe very current, um, you can still do this. You can still help kids learn how to code. Um, so you just go to code.org, and we're going to click here. Actually, I'm going to go go down here to start. This is kind of an introductory video, but if we go, there's another video that's a little more specific to the tutorial, I think. Oops, maybe I need to go back and actually do that tutorial, or do that video. Hi, I'm Lam, and I'm Tanya, and we're lucky enough to be studying computer science. So we're trying to make this video to show that anybody can learn. We want to get 10 million students to do the Hour of Code. Hour of Code. Hour of Code. The Hour of Code. Hour of Code. Hour of Code. Hour of Code. The Hour of Code. How do you get him to get to the sun fire? He needs to do some action. I got it. Hey. Now we'll run it and see what happens. I thought like code is like FBI hacker stuff. A little bit of problem solving, a little bit of logic, it's like construction. Programming is a lot easier today. Don't just play on your phone program. Awesome. How does someone go about getting a job? Maybe take an online class at a class at a community college. You can get one of the best paying jobs in the world. I think medicine's moving into the whole computer age. Technology touches every part of our life. If you can create technology, you can change the world. So we're excited that you are participating in today's Hour of Code. We just did two lines of code. Four lines. Seven lines. Five lines. Three lines. Three lines. Three lines. Four lines. Whether you're a young man or a young woman, whether you live in a city or a rural area, everybody in this country should learn how to program a computer. It's actually really easy to learn. Girls should learn this too. Understand that language that's going to be there for the future. Anyone can learn computer science. And you can learn too. Jack Dorsey, Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates, all of y'all. I'm learning. Give it a shot. Yeah. So there's the little introduction, and now we're going to start. Oh, and it goes to another video. Second, first grade. I was named grade when I learned the program. I got my first computer when I was in sixth grade. What well, gets me excited is being able to fix people's problems. You can express yourself. You can build things from an idea. Computer science is the basis for a lot of the things that college students and professionals will do for the next 20 or 30 years. I like programming because I like helping people. I get the opportunity to build something that's going to make people's lives easier. I think it's the closest thing we have to a superpower. Getting started is the most important part. I'm a beginner myself, and I'm not new to learn. Hi, my name is Lindsay. I majored in theater in college, but I also majored in computer science. And now I model, act, and write my own apps. Let's use code to join Anna and Elsa as they explore the magic and beauty of ice. You will create snowflakes and patterns as you ice skate and make a winter wonderland that you can then share with your friends. In the next hour, you're going to learn the basics of how to code. Traditional programming is usually in text, but we'll use Blockly, which uses visual blocks that you can drag and drop to write programs. This is how even university students learn the basics. Under the hood, you're still creating code. The concepts that you'll be learning are what computer programmers use every day and are the foundation to computer science. A program is a set 
instructions that tells the computer what to do. Let's build a code for a program that will help Elsa create a simple line. We will use this later to create more complex patterns. Your screen is split into three main parts. On the left is the ice surface where you'll run your program. The instructions for each level are written right below the surface. This middle area is the toolbox, and each of these blocks is an action that Elsa and Anna can do. The white space on the right is called workspace, and this is where we'll build our program. To move around the ice surface, you'll use the Move Forward block. Here, the Move Forward block says, move forward by 100 pixels. When we press Run, what happens? Elsa moves forward a certain amount on the screen. 100 pixels, in fact. Pixels are basically very tiny squares on your computer screen. The other block we have in this puzzle says, turn right by 90 degrees. And when we use this turn right block, that makes Elsa turn a certain amount. You can play around with how far you want Elsa to turn. The angle is measured from the path ahead of Elsa. So this is a 90 degree turn, and this is a 120 degree turn. And remember, you can change the number of pixels or degrees by clicking the arrows next to them. And we'll just click that off, and we're going to go on to puzzle one. We're going to create a single line. So um, it has some directions here. It says drag a move forward block and snap it below the when run block to make Elsa move forward. And hit run to try your program. So we're just going to take this, drag it until it snaps, and hit run. And we just wrote one line of code. And if we want to see the code, we can click and see the code. And then it automatically jumps to puzzle two. So now we're going to create two lines that are at a 90 degree angle. So we want to move forward by 100 pixels. Oops. <clears throat> Turn right and move forward. And and we did it. So now if you're doing this um, in your office and you, you are playing around and it takes you a little longer or um, you want to go back because something is so, so much more fun, it does let you jump back and forth if you just click on these circles up here. So now we're going to do a square. So they've already have the two first two blocks here. So we just need to We're already down to, to puzzle three. And again, if we want to see the code, we just click on the code. Look at all those lines of codes. Computers are really good at repeating actions. You can count to 10 or 20 or 100. But a computer can count to a billion or a trillion. It won't get bored and it will only take a few seconds. Whether it's counting or drawing or anything, Computers can repeat things hundreds or even millions of times. In programming, we call this a loop. A loop is how you repeat your code over and over again. For the next puzzle, your goal is to help Anna create a square with the repeat block. Any blocks of code you put inside the repeat block will be repeated in sequence, as many times as you want. To draw a square, you could use the move forward and turn block four times. But the easier way is to tell the computer to move forward and turn by 90 degrees once, and then tell it to repeat these pair of actions four times. To do that, you need to put the move forward and turn block inside a repeat block. Remember, you can change the number in the repeat block to anything, and it will repeat what's inside the block that way.
So I think those videos are really well done. To, they you know, explain the concepts and they use both famous people and um, other people who maybe aren't famous but uh, are very diverse. And so I think that's very cool too. So now we're going to use the repeat. So um, they already have the blocks in here. All we need to do is replace the question marks with a number. So it already has the move forward and turn right blocks in here. So we just want to do that four times because there are four sides in our, our square. So and we have a square. So now we're going to create three squares and turn 100 degrees, 120 degrees. So the big, the pink repeat block, since we want to do three squares, we want to put a three in there. And then the gray one is telling us how to do a square. So we want that four, which it is. And we just need to put in the number of degrees, which is 120. But you know what? I'm going to put in 90 just to show you what happens if you do it wrong. Okay, so nothing bad happens, and it was actually kind of fun to see what happens when you do something wrong. So we just change this to 120 degrees, click on reset, and we'll run it. Okay, so we've written 12 lines of code now. Now we're going to turn the square 10 times. So we repeat this 10 times, and since there are 360 degrees in a circle, we want to, and we're doing 10 squares, we want to turn by 36 degrees, which they of course also told us that. Okay, and we've completed it, and then you can also have the option of printing this or putting it on social media. So that does, uh, that may present some, some policy issues for libraries, um, but at the very end you can print off all six of the Snowflake designs that you create, or you can even print it off at, ahead of time and have those to, to, for the kids to take home. Um, but it, I, I think just if you discuss the kids and say we're not going to show, share it on Facebook or, you know, you can, that's really not an issue. But it's fun if they're doing it at home. They can do it at home and put it on Facebook. And now we're going to create a plus sign so she can move backwards and forwards. Okay. All right, it's not really showing this here. Well, if you need, oh, it's not even, and you sit all the way over too. Try and make it full screen if you want to at the browser. Go ahead and see if that will help. Okay, well, we'll just, there we go. So we put the repeat block there, and then we're going to move these into there. Okay. Do you want 
really keep going all the way through. Um, in the interest of time, I don't know if there's some, a couple more you want to do that's significant. Yeah, you have some more time if you would like. Or Okay, I'll just do a few more and then I'll skip to the end where you can kind of create your own snowflake. And that's kind of fun for kids to do over and over again if they want to. All right, now we're going to do it 90 times. And they've also introduced the set color block here. So you can set it to a random color. Oops. Move all our blocks in there. And we need to have it go um, by f turn by 4 degrees because we're doing 90 and they're 360 degrees in a circle. Is there any kind of information out there, Anne, that tells how many times this program has been used? Um, any statistics that you could oh, see? Or? That's a good question. Um, there might be something on their website. Well, or, was there a, a counter on there? The number of, like, 93 million individual users. That they've gone in to use yeah. this particular program? Or in this you in. did use, yeah. Program. I know, as a, as a parent, you know, you'd want to encourage, but I think I'd have to mute at some point. <laughs> Get them headphones. Yeah, yes. Right. Well, and this one is the noisiest one because we're making 90 lines. We can speed it up just a little bit here. There we go. Let's go. <laughs> she hasn't fallen yet. I'm loving it. <laughs> I think that gives you a very good sense of this I like that, yeah. and how easy it is and that you really don't have to be an experienced coder to help kids. So, and again, you can share that. So, but I'm going to just jump ahead here. to number 20, which you can do whatever you want here, which is kind of fun. So if we wanted to create a snowflake of a, let's see, we'll do a, a square, and we can have her jump forward and create a parallelogram. And let's see. And we'll run it and see what happens. Okay, so um, we can try again, reset it, and go again. And so this is kind of nice if you have kids who um, are working faster than others. Um, they can do this for several times and have a lot of fun with it. So we'll just run this again so that we get it all done, and then we can it prints out a, it gives you a, you can print out a certificate and you can print out all of your, um, the snowflakes that you've done. And so um, that's kind of nice for the kids to take home and put on their refrigerator. I have mine up in my cubicle. <laughs> there you go. So that's they can great. personalize their certificate. Um, share it on Facebook or Twitter again, discuss the, your policies about social media there, or they can do it at home. And then you can print out the six ones, and you can even do that ahead of time. So, and I've got some of those um, notes on the notes and cheat sheets that um, is available on the Library Commission's Youth Coding website. Great. Thank you. <laughs> okay.
<laughs> but one thing I, I did want to say about how long does it take to go through, would you say, was it? Uh, um, if you don't do that very first video and you speed through it, it's about 30 minutes. Uh -huh. So if you, it really was designed for an hour of coding, so if you have a little introductory exercise, um, you might want to have kids review angles. Um, depending, on, especially of a mixed age group, and there may be some kids who haven't had a lot of geometry. And you said in your tutorial that you had a, a page that kind of identified that, so those of us that might need to bone up on that. But <laughs> yeah, so it, it, it probably would take an hour about the, you know, the first time you go through it, but if you're really speedy, you could do it in about 30, 35 minutes. So it would be a great program to work on after school when you get a large number of kids coming in can do that and then maybe eventually some of the young the older ones can teach the younger ones too and then just keep it going so that's great well thank you for for playing yes <laughs> and you know this this um, dovetails nicely into some of the exercises with the Khan Academy because um, I think that's in JavaScript and they have JavaScript lessons too so if they, they get interested in doing designs using coding that's a really nice nice um, resource for kids thank you again Anne. It was great to have that demonstration. I'm not sure. I was thinking sometimes about Cookie Monster, though, as the, as the for me, rhyming on that ice made me think of Cookie Monster eating cookies, you know. The sound. Oh, the sound. sound. Yes. <laughs> oh, crunch, crunch, crunch. So, so now we're moving on in the webinar, and, and we are fortunate enough to have um, several speakers, presenters, who are going to be talking to us about um, um, working with um, coding opportunities for youth that they already have established uh, programs and in, in I think in both cases they're already working with libraries. So I'd uh, like to introduce to you uh, uh, Ron Armstrong who's the Vice President uh, of Strategic Partnerships for AIM. It's a not-for-profit organization focused on building the IT talent pipeline and his role involves developing partnerships with businesses, government, education, and other nonprofit organizations for the future Ames mission. Rod also oversees Ames Lincoln office, boy you're a busy guy, <laughs> which opened in 2010 at the Nebraska Technology Park along with other Ames satellite locations that are in Nebraska, Colorado, and Tennessee. And prior to joining Ames, Rod served as the president of uh, Nebraska Interactive Incorporated, a contractor that manages State of Nebraska official web portal, Nebraska.gov and spent 20 years in the public policy field in Nebraska's uh, executive and legislative branches. So I'm hoping we get to understand a little bit more about Coder Dojo. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Thanks, Holly. Hi, everybody. Um, as Holly mentioned, I'm with AIM, um, and our mission really uh, revolves around developing the uh, pipeline of IT talent. and. Um, one of the reasons that we think this is important, um, I grew up in Broken Bow, and one of the major employers there is Adams Land and Cattle, which, you know, it's a, a feedlot and it has all the, the things that go along with that, but they are always hiring IT professionals because of the volume of information they have to manage in their business, and that's just one example of, you know, literally hundreds or, or thousands around the state. And I think economic future of, of Nebraska depends on our ability to attract young people into IT careers, science, you know, STEM careers. Um, so one of the ways that AIM as an organization has uh, started to address this is through a program called Coder Dojo. Um, this is, uh, as you can see, I've got up on the screen, this is our uh, playbook that is posted on the resource page that uh, has been shown to you earlier. Uh, but basically, Coder Dojos originated about four years ago in Ireland, and they have really swept uh, the globe in terms of creating um, these volunteer, not-for-profit, open-source coding clubs, um, certainly a number of them around the United States as well as uh, Europe and, and every place else. Um, and so what I'm going to talk to you about is kind of the, the fundamentals of how you set up and run a Coder Dojo. Um, I will say that the, the Coder Dojo, uh, if you register with the Coder Dojo, you're part of the global network um, 
it, that gives you access to some additional resources, uh, connects you with people around the world that are doing this. I would say it's certainly not a requirement that you register as a coder dojo. I think you'll find the concepts here are pretty basic, and whether or not you register, you know, you can still um, explore these kinds of events. Um, the one rule of coder dojos is be cool. Uh, which I think is sums it up pretty nicely. You can throw a whole lot of things in there. Bullying is not cool, you know, you know, all sorts of things. So it makes it real easy to say to to kids, you know, you got to be cool if you're going to participate in the Coder Dojo. Um, so I'm just going to quickly kind of walk you through this playbook and give you an idea of what's involved in setting up and running a, a dojo. I will tell you that AIM as an organization runs dojos in uh, the Omaha Council Bluffs area in Lincoln. Kearney and Scotts Bluff. Um, Omaha, we've been in a number of different locations. In Lincoln, uh, we've done a dojo at Huddle, which is uh, a really neat, uh, one of the fastest growing tech businesses in the country. Uh, but we were also um, tentatively planning to do some sessions uh, later this winter and spring uh, with the Lincoln Libraries. Uh, Kearney, we've done it in a middle school, and Scotts Bluff, we've actually worked with the library there as well. So, uh, in my mind, libraries are, are a natural you know, partner in, in doing something like this. Um, so, real quickly, just kind of looking at, um, you know, identifying the market. I mean, it's it's you, you want to look and see what other activities are going on in the community, if anything. Uh, is there an active dojo? Are there other coding clubs or organizations that are doing this kind of thing uh, that you could potentially partner with? Um, taking a stock of what your educational system is uh, in terms of you know elementary, secondary, uh, and uh, college levels as well. Um, just so you know kind of what the lay of the land is in your community as far as resources and people that either may be of assistance or may already be doing uh, programs like this. Um, in terms of the age range, typically we're looking for kids ages 8 to 17. I've seen younger kids, and you saw some examples in, on uh, during Ann's presentation of kindergartners and first graders. Certainly the, the earlier you can get them, the better, uh, get them exposed to this. But certainly we're trying to reach uh, all the way from elementary through high school. Um, None of the, the kids that get involved in this need to have any prior experience, uh, especially with the younger kids and the resources like Ann showed you. Uh, all they, they need to do is, you know, be interested in you know, playing games, working on the computer, and there are, you know, countless tools out there available to show them, you know, the fundamentals of programming uh, using that. When you get with some of the older kids, you're going to find, uh, at least we did in Lincoln, um, a little higher level of skill related to this stuff. Um, with the older kids, we used um, a, a world-building game called Minecraft, which is really popular. Um, I've been trying to learn it myself. And have <laughs> <laughs> it's slow going. Um, but the nice thing about Minecraft, there's an education version, and you can install modules that allow programming within the game. Um, and there are some resources around, you know, there are teachers that are familiar and are using this in the classroom. And librarians. Uh, and librarians, <laughs> okay. So you get to do the, the thing to consider when you're doing something like that with the, the, the other kinds of things that we've explored here, if you've got an internet connection and a web browser, you're pretty much good to go. With things like Minecraft, there's some investment involved in licenses for the software. There's server requirements because what, what you want to try and be able to do is plop all of the students that are working into this into a single world, and that requires a server set up and some bandwidth and people that know what they're doing, which we're fortunate of being at Huddle. They're you know, crazy smart on this stuff. But um, anyway, it, it, back to the age range, that's just kind of the group that we're looking at is, is the 8 to 17, maybe a little younger. Um, a, a lead for a dojo, you know, AIM takes the lead in the communities we work with, but it's basically an organization or an individual that's willing to donate space, time, and other resources to sustain the dojo. Um, as I mentioned, these are volunteer-based. Um, in our case, we've uh, assembled a group of mentors that are IT professionals 
that come in and work with us. Certainly, uh, you know, library staff would be um, a resource in that regard. Uh, educators, although this is typically outside the traditional school setting, uh, very often in your community you can find um, educators that are interested in getting involved in this. Um, and there's some language about AIM in there that, you know, is just proprietary, I guess, not, not proprietary, but specific to what we do with our programs. Um, talks about kind of our value proposition and mission. A um, little bit about some of the objections, um, just real quickly. You know, this isn't a curriculum-based program, which, you know, some people and educators I've heard mention that, you know, you, you need to have a curriculum, and this really is a curriculum-based, it's, it's exploratory using tools, but um, that's fine. I mean, I, this can dovetail into curriculum that is offered either in you know educational institutions or coding programs, um, so that's one of the common things. Uh, time, obviously, it's a time commitment, and so trying to schedule these things in such a way that um, kids and parents are going to be able to attend and not totally conflict with all the other things that they have going on. So that's why we typically try and structure these as two-hour time uh, slots. Um, with the younger kids, we pretty much require the that a parent be there with them. The older kids, we kick the parents out, <laughs> uh, typically. I'll tell you the one we did in Lincoln, the two-hour time block, the parents were more than happy to walk down the street and grab a <laughs> cup of coffee, but they came back at noon when the schedule was scheduled to end to pick up their kids, and these kids and the mentors were just head down going at it and would have gone for several more hours if we didn't just say, hey, sorry, we got to cut it off. So um, anyway, you can, you can read. Uh, all of this and, and competitors, you know, that's I just talked about. Um, okay, the typical model, again, uh, open source volunteer, uh, no standard curriculum, um, and again, the, these can use a variety of different resources uh, that Ann has talked about, the Khan Academy, etc. And they don't have to necessarily be limited to programming. You know, we're going to hear about wearable tech here shortly. Uh, so there's some hardware things that can be done. I, I think that, you know, the, the uh, palette is wide open as far as what you do. It's just how do you engage kids and get them interested in exploring these kinds of things. So it's pretty much up to the individual organization that's running these things in order to be able to, uh, how you structure it. Um, the components, the champion, um, which, you know, in the, the case of ours is AIM, the venue, which, as I mentioned, we're talking with the Lincoln City Libraries about doing that uh, at libraries here. We've done that in Scotts Bluff. It's certainly some place, uh, I think, around the state that would be an um, excellent location. And then your team of volunteers and mentors. Um, this can be educators. It can be libraries. It can be IT professionals. One thing that we uh, strongly recommend is that if it's somebody that's not already done it, that they go through a background check because you're dealing with kids. Uh, and we've done that with our mentor group. Um, so, and the resources we talked about, and really all you need to do is, you know, identify your champion. Setting a date's important because that sort of forces your hand a little bit. Where are you going to have it? Get your team together and promote it. Um, we recommend, and there's, there's some details on how you can do this, we recommend pre-registration just so you can get an idea of who's coming and uh, find a way to communicate back with them. Um, uh, and, you know, as I mentioned, if you've got a, a large group of mentors, it's a good idea to get them together once ahead of time just to kind of walk through expectations uh, of them. We try and, and land at a, about a one to three ratio of mentors to kids. So it's important to have a, a good um, group of people that are willing to serve as mentors. Um, and then promotion, you know. Uh, we didn't have any trouble uh, getting kids interested in this. I know at Kearney we had waiting lists. Uh, so, you know, libraries with your outlets, I think, would be uh, uh, really easy to do. So um, that's kind of the overview of this. As I mentioned, um, setting up and registering as a coder dojo gets you access to a, a global network and some additional resources that's certainly not required. Uh, but I think this whole approach is a very um, engaging way to get young people um, aware of and hopefully interested in pursuing these career paths. So. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rob. Well, and again, this um, 
to with the page here. The file is on our uh, web resources page, and I can see that this would be very handy to use mm -hmm. in a, in a, in a uh, community yeah. where you may not be currently situated. Yeah. I do think it's interesting the learning um, connect uh, learning connections, uh, the the concept of uh, the environment that you're just you're describing is more, you know, it's out there, you don't really have a set curriculum, is, I, I think it's making inroads into how we are uh, learning, mm -hmm. I, and which I, I like that idea, you know, it's not uh, learn by the, by, the, by the instruction that, you know, right. meet the, the criteria kind of thing, it's more along the line of allowing you to make your own, uh, you know, foyer into what you want to do. Yeah. So, well, and as Ann pointed out, I mean, it's okay to fail because <laughs> you can go back in and fix it. I, I like to say computers will do what you tell them to do, but they will do exactly what you tell them to do. <laughs> and sometimes it's more fun to see the, uh, you know, the yeah. wrong version. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Very much so. Well, thank you again for that. Um, we have uh, our next uh, presenter today is um, coming to us uh, from as a representative, I think, for UNL Extension and 4-H, and uh, she is uh, Jenny Melander. Melander. Oh, there we go. And I asked her, and then I even messed it up. <laughs> so right. make sure. it's a tricky one. And she's an assistant professor of biological systems engineering and the science literacy specialist mm -hmm. in the Institute of uh, Agriculture and Natural Resources at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. It's I-A-N-R. <laughs> Um, she's also the coordinator for the National Center for Agricultural, Agricultural Literacy and is actively engaged in several cross-disciplinary uh, regional and national efforts related to STEM education and outreach. Most recently, she was part of a team that received NSF funding to engage youth in STEM through wearable technologies. And I have to say, I'm so excited to, yeah, <laughs> to uh, have an opportunity to, to listen to her presentation when we were thinking about uh, what we would be presenting. I, I have to admit, I spent a half a day on wearable technologies in my office. <laughs> because it just is so, so yeah, fascinating and interesting. So thank you, Jenny. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. So it's been fun learning from everybody this morning and hearing what people are doing around the, the state and things like that. So like um, Holly said, I'm with the university doing science literacy specialist um, work out in the community. So that's really broad, but today we're going to focus on the wearable technologies and a little bit about robotics as well. So um, start off with the robotics. So ro robotics has been in Nebraska for um, about since 2007 or so. I'm going to have a little bit of a timeline in the next slide to give you a little history of robotics in Nebraska. But this is why Nebra uh, robotics is huge, because this is how kids respond to robotics. And it's just a lot of fun. If anybody happens to be in the Lincoln area tomorrow, we're having our That's FTC wonderful. championship. Mm -hmm. So it's our first Nebraska-sponsored FTC is the high school level of first oh, I'm robotics. Glad you mentioned that. Yes, so definitely come to the Lancaster mm -hmm. Event Center. It is a lot of fun. And the kids are amazing. We'll just blow you away how talented they are and the hard work they've been doing. But so... With FIRST, and there's other programs as well around this um, doing robotics, there's scene bots and there's specs and things like that. But really, I mean, their mission, like it says in the slide, is to inspire these young people by engaging them in science and technology and, and really showing them how to um, get excited about those things. A lot of these students um, are interested in math and science and things like that, but this just kind of is a supplemental thing for them to really get engaged in that. And um, like Rod was saying earlier, how it's be cool with the dojos. With first, it's GP. Everybody's talking about gracious professionalism. And all kids call it GP, but it's really cute. So <laughs> when they're judging and doing interviews and stuff, it's all GP. But so really teaching these kids not only the STEM skills, but how to work as a team, how to help your com competition, and, and things like that. So it's really um, building a lot of lifelong skills for these students. So a little bit of the history of Nebraska 4-H Robotics. And again, this is not talking about CNBOT and VEX and the other programs that are available. This is really focused on um, first Lego League um, in the state. So in 2007, so this was before I started at the university, um, Brad Barker and his team really started with um, just doing some summer camps, seeing if this is something that would fly in Nebraska. Um, then in 2009, they started having these tournaments where they had 24 teams. You can see through the years is that 24 teams grew to 60, and then 70, and then 98 robotics teams. I think this year for our FLL, we're a little bit over 100 teams. And so there's really a lot of schools, a lot of 4-H clubs, a lot of Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts that are participating in robotics. Um, 
The FLL tournaments are for 9 through 14 year olds. So what happened last year is that we started having all these students that were really excelling at FLL and really enjoying it and aging out of the system. And so that's when we started FTC, which is the high school equivalent of FLL. So tomorrow, if you come to Lancaster Event Center, it's free. So it's the FTC, so it's a high school level competition. So much fun. In the morning, we also have the junior FLLs. So those are six through nine-year-olds, little itty-bitty kiddos, and they're programming and doing amazing things with Legos, too. So lots of cool things with the robotics. So we've had a lot of success with robotics in Nebraska, and the students are learning what all of you guys have been talking about with the coding this morning, only they're having it in a hands-on kind of applied way where something physically is moving and doing these different tasks that they can watch. Robotics has been super successful at that. However, we're really not attracting females through robotics. And this is due to a variety of reasons, I'm pretty sure. You can see here on the slide, we've had 36% of the participants since 2007 are female. So this includes the FLL teams, the summer camps, all that kind of stuff happening. And so what this slide doesn't really tell is how those females are participating. So there are all girl, like Girl Scouts teams that come to FLL. They don't do very well, typically. They kind of aren't really engaged. They're kind of doing it because somebody forced them to do it. There are co-ed teams that have boys and girls. And those teams typically, what I've seen, this is all anecdotal. I don't have any research or data to back this up. Typically what I see is that the boys are taking over the design and the coding and all that part, and the girls are working on their team t-shirts and doing kind of the more <laughs> female aspect of the, the project. And so we've been pondering this, like, why are they not getting engaged? And there are some girls that really get this. There's a team coming from Wisconsin tomorrow that I'm so excited to see. I mean, they're traveling from Wisconsin, so you know they're, they're pretty dedicated to their robotics. But they've started a first um, ladies kind of club, and so they've been connecting with people in Australia and all around the world that are these female robotics teams. And so there's some teams that are doing really well. But as a whole, robotics isn't attractive to female students. And so that's where we got into wearable technologies. So wearable technologies um, really combines, again, the physical and digital media. So similar to robotics, where you're having that hands-on, in addition to the coding, connected. Um, and you get to see some of those parts that aren't usually seen by the students. So when you're working with a robot, you usually have like a plug into one, as into a sensor, a plug into a motor, that you're realizing where those connections are occurring. This, they're actually sewing the circuits, so everything is created by the students. So wearable technologies, of course, is really coming to the forefront in society right now. This is an Apple Watch, which is newly available. I believe this month they released it. Um, usually, I don't see any in this room, but usually there's probably somebody on the web that is wearing a Fitbit. And so Fitbits are growing in popularity. Everybody's watching their steps and when they need to get up and having little alarms go off when they reach their step count and things like that. So it's really coming. Um, a technology piece that we're really getting familiar with, as well as making huge strides in art. So this is at the London Fashion Show, I believe. Um, this is a model that's wearing a Tinkerbell costume, I guess. And so this is something that was created combining art and these kind of wearable technologies. So she's wearing all these fiber LEDs and um, really making some cool things with how you can make this beautiful as well as technology driven. So with our wearable technologies program, we're developing a curriculum. Like Holly mentioned earlier, we were just funded by the NSF um, last year for a three-year program to develop a curriculum around wearable technologies. So we're working with SparkFun, who is um, a company in Boulder, Colorado, that produces all of these pieces. So we were out there in December, and they're amazing. If anybody ever gets the chance to visit SparkFun, they're, they're really fun. Which makes sense, because they're SparkFun. <laughs> yes, but they're super cool people. Um, and so we're developing these 60 hours of curriculum that can be used with 4th through 6th graders bridging in-school and after-school time. And so this is where maybe the libraries can get involved if there's an in-school educator that you can partner with. That's really what we're looking for is those combined um, teacher pairs. So overall, what we're hoping to learn through this project is, is it possible to attract more of these underrepresented students, in particular females, but also minority groups, um, to stem through this wearable technologies um, activities. And then can we bridge that formal and informal education learning environments? So through wearable technologies, we're able to teach students a lot of the same things that we do with robotics. And so engineering design process is a huge thing that we're wanting them to learn. So 
This is the 4-H representation of engineering design. If you search engineering design images on the web, you'll find a gazillion different options. Um, I particularly like this one, not just because it's 4-H, but because it's circular. So as I'm trained as an engineer, so as an engineer, I know that engineering design is a very iterative process. And so when I see it all lined up in a row that you just go neatly through all these steps, it's like, that's not real. You've got to be able to go back and change and go back and make a new problem statement if that's something that you think needs be tweaked a little bit later, make up more brainstormed ideas or things like that. So we're able to teach the students engineering design through this um, activity as well as they learn circuitry. So in addition to the coding and the engineering design, which we'll talk a little bit about coding in the next slide, I believe, um, they're sewing all of these circuits. So this is um, a rocket ship, I believe, one of the students made. Um, you have little LEDs on the, guess the, the wings of the rocket. I think they look like shoulders. That's why I'm pointing at my shoulders. <laughs> But, and then they have the, the battery pack, and uh, the little round piece is a microcontroller. And so this is one that comes pre-programmed. There are also larger microcontrollers that the students can program themselves, which makes it super exciting. So for this um, rocket ship, you can see the little dots around all these pieces. Those are con connected with conductive thread. And so the students actually get to make those connections. They get to decide where the positive connects to the negatives and all those kind of things. Um, which is really interesting because when you're doing circuitry with maybe alligator clips or something like that, you just plug it in and see if it works. If it doesn't, change them around. Here you're actually thinking, okay, where is this line going to go? i got to make sure it doesn't cross any of the negatives if it's a positive, and kind of planning your circuit system. And so it really makes them think about where those circuits are being connected, which seems to be kind of drilling it into their heads a little bit, bit better about how the circuit functions. So with the programming, since that's the main topic today, um, these LilyPad components, so the, the wearable technology that we're using is LilyPad, which is what is provided by SparkFun. They're all programmed in Arduino. So this is a screen capture of a really simple program. It's the Blink. So it's blinking an LED on their circuit. This is one of the um, templates that they have available through Arduino. So it's something you can just open up and run right away, which makes it pretty easy to get started. So Arduino is a legit programming language. So some of the things we were seeing earlier with, um, like, we didn't see earlier, but talk about like Scratch and things like that. Those are kind of made up little kid programming languages. This is great. It's super for helping kids kind of get the ideas of um, how programming works and things like that. And there's actually a, a component for um, this Arduino language, ArduBlock, which looks a lot like Scratch. It's almost identical. And so there's ways to do that. But there's also the option to do these actual lines of code. So there's professors at the university that use Arduino. So this is something that's really cool for the kids to get to use. We piloted these activities in Nebraska City last spring, so almost a year ago now. Um, and we came in on the programming day, and we were terrified. We were like, these are lines of code. What are the kids going to do? They're sixth graders. So like, oh. And to make it even better, they had done state testing that day. And so they had these fried little mushy brains. And I'm like, here, write some code. <laughs> They loved it. It was so impressive. Yeah, they were just going to town with it, and they were changing the lines of code. They were making different LEDs blink and making running lights and just having a lot of fun. So it was interesting to see that the students actually were able to pick up on these um, lines of code and make some really cool um, things from them. So what have we seen so far? Um, we've only been doing this for a year, not even quite. So last summer we piloted with a Clover College and a couple after-school programs or summer school programs, and we had 58% of the participants were female. So compared to the 36% we had with robotics over several years, this looks promising. So we're hoping to continue to see this trend and hopefully seeing some um, increased interest in female students in coding and in engineering design and all of these um, different pieces. So just to end with, we're going to take questions later. So. But this is one of the students at Nebraska City. I always like to show her picture. This is Brooke. Brooke's a good kid. So you can see how she's got her little flower bracelet on. If you look really super close, there's a little LED that she's programmed in the center of her little flower bracelet. She wore that to school the next day, and all her friends were all jealous. And what did you do? Where did you make this? And yeah, so it's just a really fun, um, fun way to get kids excited about coding and something that they can actually wear and, and feel and touch. So I brought a couple little examples. I don't know if we're going to be able to see these very well, but that's all right. We'll turn the lights. All right, turn the lights down. So these are a couple um, things, little monsters that we've made. Yeah, so you can see kind of 
We got little blinky lights. This one's probably easier to see. This one has purple LEDs that are horrible. They don't shine very well. Yep. All right, there's that guy at least. Yeah, so <laughs> he's got some blinking lights on. So these are the type of activities that students can be doing um, with their wearable technologies. Well, thank you so much yeah, for sharing. Where do I sign up? <laughs> I'll, I'll volunteer and help. I'll definitely, learn. Definitely. <laughs> really, it does sound great. Thanks so yeah, much for definitely. providing that opportunity to hear more about that. Um, so we've uh, we've seen the, the online uh, resources. Um, we have uh, worked with uh, some of our uh, um, organizations across the state who are. are uh, able to help us and our, we see are already working um, in some cases with libraries and you may be familiar with uh, some of these um, organizations and have worked with them. Um, now uh, our next step is to actually uh, hear from the libraries who have um, offered these programs related to coding and to STEM uh, work and in particular we have two today who have agreed to volunteer and give a little highlight and one is the Norfolk Public Library and I know that this last December they participated uh, had a couple sessions of the Hour of Code and we would like to let them highlight what it is that they've been um, their experiences there and in particular we have um, I think it's Anika Ramirez uh, who will be one of the uh, speakers and I, I believe she coordinated for the most part uh, the actual uh, event and then uh, Jessica Chamberlain, who is the uh, actual uh, library director there at the Norfolk Public Library. So I think we get, we're ready to transfer. It's already done. Oh, okay. So welcome, ladies. Thank you. Hello. Well, we just want to take a few minutes and kind of share what our experience was. Um, Anne talked earlier a lot about code.org and saw, showed that frozen tutorial. Um, so you kind of already have a little background on what the Hour of Code is, but what we really tried to um, push out there for the public was that, you know, this program is designed for everyone. Um, it's designed to demystify code and show that anybody can learn the basics. Um, so that was definitely our experience, that uh, people with a wide variety of experience or no experience at all certainly were able to participate in half the time. So, why did we do it? <laughs> um, you know, through some community conversations that we had had in the past year, we knew that we wanted the library to be a part of encouraging STEM learning for youth and that science and technology piece. Um, but we also knew that we weren't going to get all of a sudden this huge influx of resources in order to do that. So we had to find a way to try to encourage that with what we had at hand. Um, and luckily, the Hour of Code website is a very rich resource, but we were also lucky enough to have Anika come in and volunteer um, and offer to do this program for us. So I'm going to let her speak a little bit about why she wanted to do it. So I had actually just learned my first little bit about coding in September for an Intro to IT course, and I was someone who realized that it's actually not as scary as it seems. Um, it's doable. There's resources online for it. And so when I happened to run across the Hour of Code website um, and saw what they were doing with this week-long event worldwide, I got really excited about um, wanting to help other people experience that and the fun that it can be. And um, uh, yeah, and so also Coding is one of the fastest growing jobs these days, and so I think also one of the reasons I wanted to participate in this is because it's it's really important to help people build those computer literacy skills, um, and coding is just one way to do that. And I want to echo that a little bit too, what Anika said about, you know, she had to learn this in college for a class. Mm -hmm. I had the same experience that um, I had to do it in school too, and once I was just exposed to it, it was so empowering to learn a little bit about what goes behind the scenes of this technology that we use so much. And it really didn't take a whole lot of learning on my part to, to get at least a peek into that. You know, I certainly am not some expert coder or anything like that, and you know, I didn't want to be an IT professional, but it was wonderful to learn that little bit about what everything is based on. And I think it really helps take some of that um, 
scared factor away from people that are afraid they're going to ruin it or they're afraid they're going to hurt the computer to kind of learn a little bit about that. Um, so we kind of planned it just like we would um, any other program as far as the library is concerned. We took two target audiences. Um, we decided to do like um, a younger kids like ages 9 to 13 and then we did a second program for ages 14 and up. And Anika went through all the tutorials and, mm -hmm. and um, decided which ones we wanted to do for each audience. And then we just kind of promoted it the way we do the rest of our library programs. And the only difference was we really pushed this out to our schools in a big way. We wanted the schools to know that the library was doing this, that we wanted their students to participate. We talked to our teachers who were with our challenge program, our talented and gifted program. We we talked to all of our parochial schools. We sent general messages out to any of the computer skills teachers. Um, you know, we really tried to let them be aware so that they would encourage students to participate. So I'm going to let Anika talk a little bit about how it turned out. OK, so um, we had a full room our first night for the uh, 14 and up uh, class. There was people sharing computers and we were, we were pretty packed in there, so that turnout was, was awesome. It was very good to see. Um, the older crowd, it was a little harder to get a read on how they really felt about it. I think we got some good feedback as they were leaving, um, but people were much more uh, serious about what they were doing. Um, and then in the, the younger group, um, it was mostly middle schoolers. We had two girls, and then the rest were boys. And they were much more vocal about um, what they were doing, their progress and their success, and um, more collaboration between them, I think, um, was a really interesting thing. One boy just got up and helped another one, you know, and, and it, they just did that on their own. Um, so it was really cool to see that part of it. Um, and, yeah, overall, I think, overall, I think it was amazing. <laughs> Uh, and from the library's perspective, it was awesome. Um, you know, I send out press releases all the time for every program that we do and for all of our author visits and all those kinds of things. And I very rarely hear back from the media without, you know, contacting them first and, and trying to get more, more coverage. Um, I sent out just my generic press release about this program, and both of our local radio stations called me back within the hour and wanted to do radio stories and interviews about this program. So that was awesome and from our perspective, that this was something that really caught their eye that they thought was really cool that we were doing. And one thing I just want to say for people who are thinking about maybe doing this, um, one thing that the Hour of Code really uh, pushes is you don't have to know it yourself. I just went through each tutorial that I chose full, all the way through so I understood how each step needed to go. Um, and then I really, and at the beginning of each class, made sure that everyone knew, like, I'm not the expert. We're going to work together on it. Uh, it's a collaborative effort to get everyone toward the end. So there's questions. Like, questions are obviously welcome, but I'm not always going to know. And I just made sure that that was, everyone was aware that, like, <laughs> I don't have the right answer every time. So that's less intimidating as a, as a leader of the event or the program. And we would definitely do it again. We hope to um, incorporate more tech kind of programs like this throughout the year. Um, but certainly participating in the Hour of Code next December is something that we're planning on. The only thing that we would change would be that um, during the Hour of Code, they released a whole bunch of new tutorials. Um, like that Frozen tutorial wasn't available until that week. So, um, you know, Mika had selected the tutorials ahead of time. But now that we know a bunch of new ones will come out that week, next time we might just advertise the Hour of Code program in a more generic way and then select the tutorial closer to the program time so we'd have more choices. So. That's it. Unmuted. Well, thank you so much. I, it's all very exciting. I um, was aware that you were doing that program, and it's great that, as you stated, that Anika is the volunteer. Um, coming in. I know she has some library background as being formerly a director, but um, that's the beauty of this uh, working with these uh, types of programs is that you may have somebody in your community who might be is committed to coming in and helping you. And I think about the library as the place because uh, you have your broadband speed and you 
um, have uh, your technology, you have computers or you have Wi-Fi, you can gather a group together and you can um, offer a program for youth um, to learn. The other aspect I've been thinking about is how, um, you know, we, we lay our own uh, fears or thoughts about coding um, in a library. Perhaps an older person may feel that they're not at all, you know, worthy or interested in, in being a part of this and they, they feel like they may ha have a failure and let alone I think sometimes you could just put the program together and turn the, the youth loose on it and they would manage it all on their own and, and have a fantastic uh, opportunity to learn and you would basically just be providing the, the space for them to work with and uh, an adult supervision and uh, that would be very helpful I think if, depending on how, what age you're at, maybe all the ages. So uh, our final presentation uh, presenters are from the Grand Island Public Library and um, they are going to offer us some of their background and uh, experiences working with the robotics program for a summer um, summer pro uh, reading program that, that they offered a few years ago. And we're going to be uh, having uh, Steve Bosselman, who's the director of the Grand Island Public Library, and uh, Celine Swan, the youth services librarian, give us some background on uh, how the robotics programs worked at their library. Take it away. Hi, everybody. Um, try to guess which muted is Steve and which one is Celine. <laughs> uh, we are all involved at our library in youth services, but Celine is definitely the youth services librarian and wears many hats, including the bear hat that she took off. And I am uh, here just to add a little bit to her presentation, but um, uh, she works with uh, children, tweens, and teens, and she's been involved in a couple activities that she'll take you on a little photo tour of. Well, hello, everybody. Um, this uh, first picture here is from the year 2010. We are... 14. Oh, that one's a 2014. Oh, yeah. This one's just from last, last summer. And we um, had a couple of teens that were homeschooled that were involved in robotics in Aurora. And so uh, we really like to do a lot of programs where teens give us ideas and feedback. And uh, they really wanted to do something with robotics and show their friends and the other teens in the community how much fun robotics is. So they uh, got together with one of our other staff members and they planned it out. And we really had a great attendance. And you can see in the pictures that we had a lot of girls attend. And, you know, this might not be their thing, but I think because they were friends and they've been attending a progr uh, programs all summer that they showed up to support them, and I think they learned a lot from it. They got to try to run the uh, robotic um, little modules, and um, the newspaper showed up, and the photographer and the news person were pretty young, and they were, everybody just had a great day. And I think um, it kind of opens up doors to see that it's really fun, and it's not that hard. And the kids were the experts, and they brought along their club sponsors, but it was a really fun day, and uh, I think we got a lot of really good feedback from the community. And I think when we do some robotics or coding this summer, I think kids will be really gung-ho about attending. But um, you can see there's some, they took a lot of pictures when they were here. So this was in 2014. And our other picture, um, this is for the year 2010. And this program we did in partnership with Grand Island Public Schools. And um, we do a lot of partnerships with other agencies and um, businesses in the community. Wherever we can find that expertise and people that are willing to share their passion, we have them come in. And a lot of times they'll do programs for free, or sometimes we might have to pay a small fee, but it's great to have a variety of programs for, for youth to get them excited about different things. But um, this program here, we actually had one of our uh, library board members, Chris McElliott, in the purple shirt there. Um, she had worked at NASA, and she's an engineer, and her kids were active in the club at Grand Island Senior High, and so the integration specialist there, Julie Hinky, and Chris came in, and they said, hey, we'd like to do this program in the summer, and we'll bring in all the, all the parts, and um, we'll, we want to get other kids involved, and we want to get them excited and maybe have them join our club. And so they brought the stuff in, and um, we found a place to store it through the summer. So I know a lot of the parts were expensive, and um, they had specific guidelines 
for the competition that they were going to be in um, in the spring. So um, the kids that came in uh, were from uh, some of the middle schools, and you can see them on the right side. They were putting down their ideas, and I think she had them put together what she thought would work, and then they put together the little robotic part of it, and then sometimes it didn't work, so they had to tear it down or part of it down, but they got the kids really into hand-on um, manipulating the items. And so we didn't have very many girls in this one, but um, after seeing some of the presentations with the clothing and the sewing, um, we've done several programs with sewing, and I can really see some of our teens here getting excited about um, putting together something that um, even the boys would sew. It was really cool. <laughs> we've made um, little stuffed animals, and uh, we've done things with Legos, and kids really do like the hands-on part of it. And uh, so it was really fun. I think, um, you know, kids like Legos, and they love the trying new things. So I can see us... Um, for Teen Read Week, I really want to uh, start with a coding program for teens and get them going and then have them come in the summer and work with the, the little kids on uh, some coding activities. So we're really excited to try new things. So I, I'm excited about coding right now. So I'm learning a lot from you guys. So that's our little summary <laughs> of our program. Unmuted. Sad. This is uh, board member Chris McElligot and um, Julie Henke. She's not pictured here. However, uh, she, she was a former staff member. She is a current city council member, and she is um, council member liaison to our library board. And so, we, as Celine said, we try really hard to make sure that these partnerships work out for the benefit of, of these children and, and teens and tweens. And it's, it's just, uh, Celine has taken our uh, services to a new height and through uh, coding, robotics, uh, wearables. All Science. Of, yes. <laughs> uh, I think our children's section will physically change in the future, and we'll, um, uh, we'll, we'll continue along this path where we actually consider our children's section to be like a, a children's museum. It's an interactive uh, museum quality uh, atmosphere where uh, learning is hands-on. That's all I got. Well, thank you very much. Um, you know, it, it's interesting to uh, the Norfolk Public Library and the Grand Island Public Library, their contribution here. I, I hear the words uh, collaboration, community collaboration, enthusiasm, uh, something new, um, exceeding expectations. I, I just can't imagine that, uh, that uh, libraries wouldn't uh, be thinking this, this is for all, all libraries. This is something that we can do, um, especially with the idea that uh, when we're looking at this uh, with our other presenters, you can see that there are a lot of um, opportunities to uh, to work with other uh, Nebraska-based uh, organizations to assist you as you're as you're looking to do the planning. Um, I would like to emphasize again for Sally and I, we would love to have this feedback um, for uh, from libraries who have been successfully running these programs because. Yeah, we could see this as a knowledge base to work with and uh, be able to help uh, libraries to connect with and collaborate with uh, other organizations across the state or maybe have uh, uh, interesting ideas as to what the, uh, a program might look like for their library, maybe by their size or, or what they have available for space. Um, and uh, so I thank you all for being uh, a part of this. And we do have, I believe, a little bit of time for some Q&A. Uh, if you uh, have, uh, would like to ask a question of one of our presenters, please go ahead and type that in now. Mm -hmm. And yep. we'll let Krista take over with uh, asking the questions. If you have any questions, you should go to webinar interface, type there in the questions section, and I can grab them here and repeat them. Well, in the meantime, I do want to say thank you to our presenters. Um, this was a great opportunity to get a group of people together and appreciate you, you that are participating as registration uh, registrants because I know it takes um, a lot out of a, a, a prime Friday morning to listen to this if you're live. I have a question while waiting to see if, if people out there go over here. Okay, well, I want you to go over there to answer. Uh -oh. Okay, <laughs> so. come on over <laughs> together. The 
this is Sally asking, and, and I was really fascinated by the wearables, and I can really see a number of uh, teens in particular, but other age groups getting interested in that. And I'm curious about um, acquiring the little discs and the costs and how right. readily you can get some and, and what, how much expertise you need to in order to buy the right thing. So right, right, right. I just dumped a whole bunch of questions <laughs> yes, on that you. Is a lot. That's <laughs> actually, you, you actually must have been reading someone's mind. Um, <laughs> oh. Nicole Lawless out there just actually typed in the first question. That was, I'm curious about the costs for the wearable tech. Yes. Yeah. All right. So that's always the trick. So the things that are online, of course, are free, typically, and are easy to do and access. Um, with wearable technologies, it is a little bit expensive. The really tricky part is, unlike robotics, a lot of it isn't reusable. Unless you take apart mm -hmm. your creations, which a lot of students really don't want to do. And so what we've, like the, the big microcontrollers that the students can program, those run about $30. So the littler pieces are in the two to five to ten maybe dollar range. So it's not extravagant, but when you're talking large groups of students, it gets expensive really quickly. So most of these, um, all of the products that we use actually, not to plug SparkFun in any way, <laughs> but everything we buy is from SparkFun. And so if you just go to their website, they actually have kits. And so I didn't bring one, but they have a little um, lightning bugs in a jar kit. And so you can have little LEDs blinking and it kind of is the shape of like a mason jar, and so kids can sell it together as a kit. I don't remember what that runs. I think it's less than ten dollars. But so things like that, it's it's doable if you want to get the really um, sophisticated, but you're programming yourselves. So that's where it gets a little bit more expensive. But you know, good question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Connie Hancock was out there from yeah. to say that many county extension offices have youth educators who have ex expertise with STEM. Mm -hmm. So reach out and connect and ask them to come into your libraries yep. to help out. Good. Good to add that to it. Yes. Oh, so why don't you just spell the name of the place? And I assume you guys might put the link up too for the... Oh, for Spark Fun? Yeah. yeah. So it's just S P A R K F U N. I mm -hmm. believe it's all one word. Sparkfun.com, I think. I don't know. But yeah, Google Spark Fun. <laughs> so they have yeah, so I mean the wearable technologies is a small part of what they provide. There are so many fun things from Spark Fun. So and they do make lots of kits, so if there's things that look interesting, you can pick up those pieces. And they also have tutorials on their web page. Yeah. So I, there's a link to the to Soul Electric, and that's oh another yeah, Soul Electric. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Same. And spell that. Soul S, -S E W as in Soul. Oh, stop. Yeah. So oh, Soul. Like so <laughs> I was going with the sun. S O L. Soul Electric. <laughs> no, no, no. I don't know why. So, so S E W. Yes. Soul Electric. That was actually written by Leah Buckley who is the one who created all the lily pad components. She was at MIT. Yeah, So Electric is on, actually, if you want to go to you guys' web page, it oh, it's actually on there. Yeah, the So Electric Oh, we're so is. good. Thank you. Whoops. No. Oh, one, one of the other one tabs, the tabs would be the top. Top. So, Jenny, are you looking for libraries and community partners to work on your um, grant project? Right. At this point, we're in the piloting stage. So this next year or so, we're developing a lot of curriculum and trying to figure out how that's all going to play together. So we already have four or five sites selected for this year. In the coming years, we'll definitely be looking for people to partner with us. So the really important piece with, um, with our grant, I mean, you can go and do this on your own. We have talked with groups about doing it separately. To be included in the grant, it has to be... Um, an informal informal educator pair. And so if, like, if you had a librarian pair with somebody that's a formal fourth to sixth grade teacher, that's really what we need to be supported by the grant. And we are doing 90 teacher pairs, so we will be looking for help in the next couple of years. Yeah. Good opportunity. And as they said, we do have So Electric on our new coding web page, so you can look at that. And we'll be looking at adding things as people make recommendations, so thank you. Yeah. Now we do a question about having contact information for First or Coder Dojo. Is that what the link on the site would get them to yeah. be able to get a program started with that? Because I saw the Coder Dojo was linked right from yeah. there. Um, Why can't I now? The contact there is Cheryl Steed, but... Um, oh, there it is in that yeah. playbook there, yep. But uh, anybody can feel free to get a hold of me too, and it's just... R. Armstrong at aimforbrilliance.org. 
I sent the contact information yet okay. yesterday, right. so you should have that in your email that you received from Holly yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, and if it's, it's something, if it's questions from outside of Omaha, Cheryl's probably going to refer them to me anyway, so. And just a recommendation, um, adafruit.com, A-D-A-F-R-U-I-T, I assume Ada Lovelace related. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> is another good source of kits and parts similar to Spark Fun, and it's run by a woman. So if we have a recommendation for that, we'll probably add that. You guys yeah, get all this information absolutely. afterwards. We'll add that link as well to the page. And the last thing, I think we'll take one more, just because we're running along. Um, do I have, have any book recommendations for kids for coding? Oh. We got that. I should have looked up that book. <laughs> we will. We I'll will. <laughs> it will be very we'll soon. <laughs> Good question. Yes. Okay. And that's, I think that'd be it. the only last thing is, and I think this will wrap up with, is um, when will this, where will this be posted, the recording, when we're done here, I assume, on Twitter. Well, wherever you see. post it. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, how about on the website for your coding stuff? Yeah. yeah that's on that I'm same, if you go yeah. back to that same coding website, that's where we'll post this recording at some point within the next, well, let's say it's Friday. Yes, maybe today. Let's not make my life a little too. Yeah. Maybe okay. next week. Email. <laughs> we'll let you know yeah, when it is. Right. But most likely, we'll put it onto the same coding page here, Absolutely. so you'll have that's access that's to it there. Yeah. Other than that, that's it. Thank, Thank you all for participating. Thank you, and we sure oh, appreciate you. your time, and especially our presenters. And uh, send us information. <laughs> all right, are we good to go? All right. Thank you very much, everyone.